And she noticed, she said, looks like you ate a lot this time. And I said, you know what, you're right. And I should say it's because of our study of the book of Genesis. And this is not a joke. Basically, I was telling her, my study of Genesis, the first three chapters, has helped me put things, put my worldview back in proper perspective. There's so much chaos, confusion going on around us. People have forgotten on why things are the way they are in our fallen world. So there's nothing like going back to the book of beginnings and figuring out how God narrated to us in the book of beginnings how sin came into the world that helps us to explain why so much chaos and confusion is taking place in around, around the world. It's basically because we live in a fallen world. So we're looking at the third chapter and the second portion, verses 14 down to 24. Shall we stand, please, to give God honor and due reverence, reading this portion responsibly and together in the 24th verse. From verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we humbly come before thee and thank you for revealing these truths in the book of the Bible uh, for us. Lord, we are thankful that you did not leave us in the dark roping through a trial and error method how to figure out life. You have shown to us from the sacred pages <clears throat> the origin of life, where it all began, the purpose of living, at the same time our destiny basic questions of life that needs to be answered if we are to find purpose in our earthly sojourn. So thank you for reading these in the sacred pages of Scripture, particularly in the book of Genesis. And again, we ask your Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Speak to our hearts, address our concerns, whatever troubles, heartaches we might be going through. Let your word be a bomb that will heal the hurts of our soul so that we may see things from your biblical perspective and address our concerns in a fallen world in a way that would honor and glorify you. We shall thank you for it. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Alright, we're looking at Genesis chapter 3, the last portion of the book of Genesis. The chapter records for us, Moses records for us the fall of man. And we have no doubts that uh, Moses was writing this as a biblical narrative. It is a testament or a record of what actually took place at the beginning of time. We know that not because some doctor, so-and-so, scholar said it. We have the Word of God, the book of Genesis, authenticated 
by no less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he said in Matthew 19 verse 4, have you not read talking to the Pharisees of his day, his number one religious critics, and he said, have you not read that they which made them in the beginning made them male and female? In other words, God, Jesus Christ was reaffirming the historicity, the authenticity of the biblical account of creation, the book of Genesis. Therefore, there is no point, reason for us to doubt its authenticity because Christ himself placed his imprimatur on it. Don't let any so-called brilliant scholar, no matter how brilliant he might be, trip you up into thinking this is just a story with a lesson or simply a fable or a myth. The truth of the matter, this is historical narrative. And not only did Jesus Christ reaffirm its authenticity, the Apostle Paul in the epistles cited it as basis for his apostolic teaching. And so it's so important we understand the first three or even 11 chapters of the book of the Bible because much of it is the foundation for our apostolic teaching, not all of the, of the prophets and the apostles. It reaffirms our confidence in the documents of both Old and New Testament Scripture. And I trust you're seeing that as we study these pages. So we saw from Genesis chapter 1, the uh, verse 1, the summary account of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a summary account of what God has done. And from verse 2 down all the way to chapter 2, verse uh, 3, we find the chronological account of creation. Moses, as he was moved by the Holy Spirit, was narrating to us the chronological account from day one to day two, all the way to day six. How God created the world in six literal 24 hour solar days. How do we know that? In contrast, in contrast to uh, uh, Darwinists. Because the Bible says so. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. And so on and so forth. And at the, end, the beginning of each day, the Bible says, God said and it was so. In other words, God created everything out from nothing. Ex nihilo is the Latin word. Without pre-existing material. God simply said and it was so. He created everything by the fiat of his word. God said it, so it came to pass. At the end of each day, the biblical record of Genesis chapter 1 tells us, that God said it was good. At the end of the second, third, fourth, fifth day, God said it was good. Something in the sixth day happened. That's why God said it was very good. And what was that? God created the crown of his creation. And that was man. In other words, Genesis, the first six days, or you know, six days, God was basically preparing man's habitat. And finally, the prime of his creation the only one in God's created order that was created after God's own image and likeness finally was placed in God's perfect habitat for man in the Garden of Eden. So much of that truth is, uh, is basis for much of biblical exhortation. Genesis chapter 9 verse 6 tells us why capital punishment or the death penalty is endorsed by God for human governments. Why? Because anyone who kills a human being kills him who is created after God's own image and likeness. That's a serious offense. In other words, the reason why it's wrong to kill a human being is because you are create, you are killing someone whom God has created after his own image, Genesis 9, 6. In the New Testament, James chapter 3 tells us that it is wrong to maltreat a fellow human being, Christian or not. It's wrong to curse any fellow human being, Christian or not. Why? Because he was created after God's on image and likeness. So it does matter what we, how we understand things. That's why it is wrong to treat, maltreat people based on social status, based on race. It doesn't matter. Why? Because God has created every human being after God's own image and likeness. See, so when people say what Black Lives Matter, we teach our children this song. It still is true. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Every human being is created after God's own image and likeness. A beautiful narrative of uh, chapter 1 is cosmologic, how God created the whole universe. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, we find God resting the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day. Not that He got weary or tired. Of course, God is an omnipotent God. He can do everything. 
but he rested in his work of creation. But his work of providence began. God not only created everything, he is sustaining everything by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3, and Colossians 1, 16, 17. All things, by him all things consist. Colossians 1, 16, 17. Meaning to say the word consist means hold together. Can you imagine if by the smallest fraction of a second, God withholds his sustaining work of divine providence? It's going to be chaos. But God has not done that because that's his plan. He is not only the author of all things, he is the sustainer of all things, and in fact, he is the purpose why everything is created. All things were made by him and were created for him. Question, are you living for that purpose? Many of us, since the fall, live our lives as if we are the owners of our own fate, sadly. And from the very beginning, God created us for a purpose, a divine purpose, an intelligent purpose. We were created for him and for his pleasure. Chapter 2, verses 5, down to the rest of the chapter, we see the topical account of creation. The Holy Spirit focuses on the sixth day and gives us more details of how he created not only Adam, but how he created Eve and established the family institution. Okay, God created Eve from one rib, establishing, therefore, a monogamous marriage. He made that, that rib into a woman. They're establishing, therefore, a heterosexual marriage. In other words, God did not create an Adam and Eve, he, uh, an Adam and Steve. He created an Adam and Eve. And yes, that needs to be said, especially in this day. There's so much confusion, gender confusion, and even churches are succumbing to this pressure. And God help us to hold our ground on the unchangeable truths of the word of God. So, so we, fi we find in chapter 2. So they were naked. Adam and Eve. Everything was transparent in the perfect habitat that God had prepared for them. This promising relationship. Adam, after calling every animal and uh, naming them. He apparently saw them in, God, in God's created order. He saw monkeys, he saw elephants, he saw tigers, he saw dogs, he saw all these animals. And they were the same, but at the same time they were different. They, he saw the gender differences between these animals. But he could not see a counterpart. God, the first thing that God saw that was not good in his creation, the Bible says it was not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me. And that's what God did. God performed the first surgery of human history, he made an Adam to fall into a deep sleep and made that rib into a woman. Adam wakes up from that surgery and he looks around the garden, sees all the animals he had named, and he said, Lo and behold, there is a visitor in the garden. Somebody I've never seen before. And he said, Finally, he said, Wow, alas, finally, at last. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That first, that phrase, uh, this is now, is in the Hebrew equivalent to the word, I found it, Eureka. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This very promising relationship of a husband and wife relationship eventually sadly became a problem. Even in society today, and how do we explain such a pristine, complete creation turns out to be a curse? It's explained to us by Moses in his inspired record in chapter 3, the fall of man. We saw the beginning verses of chapters, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. The strategy of the serpent. Okay, through uh, Satan, through that serpent. And you say, where did Satan come from? Well, he was a created being. He was an angel. A good part of God's good creation eventually rebelled against God and therefore eventually he wanted to be like God. We don't see it in Genesis chapter 3. We see it in other portions of scripture. Isaiah 14 is equal 28. And this serpent now starts to come into the Garden of Eden. We don't know how long the sixth day of seventh day of creation to chapter 3. Perhaps it's days, maybe weeks. We don't know. The Bible does not reveal that. But we know by the time Genesis 3 happens, the fall of man takes place, the serpent was in the scene, Satan was already there. 
Satan uses the serpent to allure Eve. We saw the, the details of the temptation, the strategies that the devil uses, the very avenues that he uses to allure our first parents into sin are the same avenues that the devil uses to this day. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Ambition, or rather the lust of the flesh, that's appetites, legitimate appetites. There's uh, the lust of the eyes, that's avarice, and the pride of life, that's ambition. We all have all of this, and these are sometimes legitimate concerns that Satan uses, but he tries to bridge it a little further outside the boundaries of God given in Scripture to satisfy our desires. And there's nothing wrong with desires per se. You don't have to feel guilty when you have desires. But when our desires become unbalanced and we want to satisfy them outside the boundaries of God's, of God's Word, then they do not become simply desire. They become lusts. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So we saw that from verses 1, 2, 3. From Adam and Eve eventually looking at the fruit, and then she eats and gives to her husband. He eats, and both of them fall into sin. It started with an attitude that culminated, that culminated in an action. And eventually, all of a sudden, the nakedness that they enjoyed in the Garden of Eden before the fall, eventually they felt it when sin and guilt started coming in. God called Adam. Adam, where are thou? Obviously, God knew what was already happening, but he wanted it to come from Adam. And Adam finally says, well, I'm here, God. But well, who told you that you were naked? Was it the woman you gave me? Blame shifting happens. He was not only shifting the blame to Eve. He was also blaming God. The woman? In fact, you gave her to me. That was what Adam was doing. So the woman said, so what happened? Well, the serpent. You see, is that what that's reflective of our sinful natures when we're caught in sin? So, eventually we see from verses 14 down the line the uh, curse that God gives upon Adam and Eve. The sentence that God gives. We find here the verdict that God gives when Adam and Eve rebels against God. God's instructions were very plain and simple. You may have to eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good. And the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. They didn't have 66 books of the Bible. They had two, three lines to live by. And they failed. God gave them a test and they failed the test. So in this remaining verses of chapter 3, we see them expelled from the Garden of Eden. This beautiful utopian habitat where they can enjoy all of God's creation and enjoy each other's communion while enjoying communion with God. This time they will be expelled from paradise. Why? Because of sin. This should serve as a reminder to us that we can run from God but we cannot hide from Him. All human attempts to flee from all the all-seeing eye of Almighty God are bound to fail. Adam and Eve soon realized in their depraved state the severity of God's perfect justice. So let us take note in our notes. Two main points. We will see God's unbending punishment. And number two is God's unmerited provision. God's unbending punishment. The New Testament author, or rather the New Testament declares in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, verse 13, that neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do or give an account. We can run from God, but we cannot hide from him. All things are naked before him. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. That is why we become totally illogical and irrational every time we sin. We think we can sin and hide from God. No, we cannot. Because everything is naked before him. 
The eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Thus God's judgments are always based on the hard facts. He knows everything and is never done in ignorance. As God passes his judgment, he started where sin began. The curse has the idea of banishment from the place of blessing. All of creation would now be barred from the fullness of fertility and harmony. These are not commandments in verses 13 all the way to 24. These are not commandments from God to be obeyed, but they are declarations of how life now must be after the fall. Let us observe what happened since. Well, notice first of all, the serpent was penalized. Verse uh, 14. <clears throat> And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the serpent who represented Satan was singled out to be cursed above all cattle. While all of creation would lie under God's curse, the reptile would be cursed above all. When God pronounced on it that upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, according to verse 14, it seems this was the first time the serpent began to crawl. But the devil's ultimate destruction is predicted in verse 15. The continuous enmity between him, the serpent, and the seed of the woman will cause his final demise. Verse 15, we read that. And I, God says, will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. The serpent will bruise your head. But thou shalt bruise, or rather, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, or crush thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. The verse is often called by theologians as the Proto-Evangelium. In other words, this is the first time the gospel is hinted in all of the scriptures. Amid the passing of divine judgment, God gives hope for the first time by shedding initial light on the good news that salvation from sin and victory over Satan are available through the seed of the woman or the Messiah referred here as the seed of the woman. God's curse on him speak of humility. Imagine this serpent will begin to crawl, crawl on his belly, eating on dust along with his food. You have exalted yourself far above like the God himself, like the creator, then you will crawl in the dust. That's God's way of humiliating his fallen creature. Remember the Bible says, pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. That's God's curse upon the serpent. The serpent was penalized. Moving further, the woman herself was also penalized. Verse 16, unto the woman he, God, said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. What is the point? Ever since the rebellion against God, childbearing would carry the effects of the curse. Women, every time you give birth, and all that pain that you have to go through is a reminder of the fall. What happened at the Garden of Eden? Giving birth since then would be accompanied by severe pains. Eventually, the womb that was originally designed to bring forth godly seeds would eventually deliver inherent sinners. All as a result of what happened with the rebellion of our first parents. Also, life now must bear a struggle between the male and the female. Did you notice that in verse 16? And uh, it says, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire, you, Eve, 
Your desire shall be to thy husband. Now there are those expositors who say, maybe that's referring to sexual desire. Perhaps, but it seems from the context, since this is part of the God's oracle of divine judgments, it seems that it means more than that. Life must now be a struggle between male and female. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Alan Ross gave his exe careful exegesis on the passage, and let me quote him at length. He says, the Hebrew word desire has some of the same uses as, that the English word has. In this passage, it is commonly explained to mean that the woman would be drawn to her husband, probably so explained on the basis of the usage in the Song of Solomon. But the word also occurred in, the, in this context of Genesis with quite another meaning. According to its use in Genesis 4 verse 7, let's turn there quickly. Genesis 4 verse 7, what does that passage say? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be the, his desire. That's the Hebrew word. Thou shalt rule over him. It's not about the desire of sin over Cain. So, again, going back to the quotation from Alan Ross, he says, um, the idea of the verse would then be that because the woman prompted the man to sin and giving him something to eat. That is, taking the lead, rather than maintaining a partnership, the man would have dominion over her. And therefore, Ross says, I would translate this this way, your desire was to your husband, but he shall have mastery over you. That's how we paraphrase that. The punishment then would also be that would be talionic for the woman, meaning to say, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. This view also finds support in verse 17, because you obey your wife, he tells Adam. In other words, it is important to the understanding of this line is the word, the meaning of the word rule. He shall rule over thee. This word cannot be weakened to mean leadership alone. The man shall rule over you. Does not mean to be leader, as many expositors wish to do. It is a term that describes dominion, mastery, lordship. It can rather have a harsh application. The significant point about this verse is that it is part of the punishment oracle for sin. If Eve is an archetype, that is, if, if she represents every woman as Adam represents every man, then the story portrays a characteristic of human nature. The woman at her worst would be a nemesis to the man, and the man at his worst would dominate the woman. You get the point? In other words, every time husband and wife have a quarrel, a power struggle, this is God reminding us this is exactly part of the curse. Your desire shall be to your husband, but he will, do, will, will dominate you. Oh, no wonder. I just had a quarrel with my wife or with my husband. That's a, ref, a reminder of the fall. But you know, when somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, you know, I am, I am madly in love with my husband, and so am I madly in love with my wife. We're living in cloud nine all my days of my life, liar. There are struggles in every home. Why? It all began at the curse, at the fall in the Garden of Eden. So how would the oracle apply in succeeding generations? It may be argued that the male domination in the history of the human race is a perpetual reminder of the fall, just as the serpent's crawling on the ground. So, those of you who are planning to get married, I always tell this during counseling, if you want to serve Jesus Christ, stay single. If you want to be like Christ, get married. 
And that's not a joke. But I mean that. You get married, you will be more and more like Jesus Christ. You'll have to exercise patience, the fruit of the Spirit, etc., etc. While serving Christ as a husband and wife team. All of you who are married for some time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a reminder of the fall. Welcome to reality. See, couples want to get married, and they're during the wedding day, boy, they are on cloud nine. Boy, I gotta get this. When I can, I just get these wedding bells to ring. And after the wedding bells are the electric bills and the bill bills, you know, and everything. Oh boy, this is reality. I wake up beside my wife and my husband and I finally smell his first breath in the morning. It doesn't look like heaven. This is a fallen world. So welcome to reality. Now you begin to understand, no wonder my wife is like that. Yeah, and that's why your husband, <clears throat> I am your nemesis for as long as I'm your husband. <laughs> well, I we just said, I do during our wedding day some 15, 20, in my, in my case of my wife, it's 41 years ago. And praise the Lord, he has sustained us by his grace. I'm madly in love with her, she's madly in love with me, she's not here yet. But of course, we have our struggles as a reminder of a fallen world. So let's move on. Not only was the woman penalized and the serpent penalized, now the man is also penalized. What happened since the fall? The Bible says in verse 16, well, verse 17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee. These are the two indictments that God gave to Adam. You have hearkened to the wife. By the way, I'm saying this, that this is not to say, men, don't listen to your wife. Okay, I'm not saying that. But it so happens that Adam prioritized his wife over God here. And then it says further, <clears throat> because thou hast hearkened to the wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it. Here's the curse. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. So these two indictments, hearkening unto the voice of his wife and eating of the forbidden tree, were Adam's specific offenses. He heard the instructions directly from God. He, was, he heard it directly from God, and therefore he should have known better. Eve heard it secondhand from her husband. That's why the devil is so sly, he knew whom to tempt. He didn't try to tempt Adam. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul was writing, reminding us of what happened in the fall. It was Eve who was deceived, not Adam. Adam played tricks with Eve and she got caught in the play of words. So Adam should have known better and therefore he should have said, Eve, stop it! Don't get her that fruit. And even if she did, I'm not going to take that. You say, why didn't Adam do that? Well, the rest is history. He did. That's what the narrative tells us. Instead of restraining his wife from her transgression, he joined her in her misery. So God's judgment affected a number of areas. First, it affected the ground. Cursed be the ground. In other words, it is no longer going to bear fruit for him as before. In the Garden of Eden prior to the fall, everything was well provided. It was a utopia. It was a perfect environment. And that does not mean Adam was not to work. By the way, Adam was not simply lying down under a tree waiting for the apple to fall in the perfect conditions. He's, no, he was not a wantaman, as we would say to do in our uh, in the Filipino folklore. In fact, Adam, pre-fall conditions, was called to work. So work is not part of the fall. Okay. Some of I remember one of our men saying, "Oh, tomorrow, pastor, is Monday. It's back to work, back to reality." But listen, prior to the fall, God told Adam to work. So work is not part of the curse. In fact, if you don't work, 
then you'll be lazy. And Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, he who does not work shall not eat. Who wants to eat? Come on, you liars. <laughs> who wants to work? Nobody. We all want to eat, don't we? But not work. But this is part of the curse of the ground. It says, curse is the ground. In other words, uh, it is no longer going to bear fruit for him as before. The second, it affected his work. The mention of thorns also in thistles is a reminder that nature was no longer subject to man's dominion. They make man's work more difficult and complex because the ground from then on would hesitatingly give its yield. That was not a problem prior to the fall. So before having yield, man has to work and well, of course, you say, Pastor, yeah, that, what man was already working prior to it. Exactly. But what was added was he had to sweat it out. While work was part of man's activity prior to the fall, this time he will have to sweat in his labors in order to provide for himself and his family. That's what verses 18 and 19 says. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face. Shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. In other words, uh, they make man's work more difficult. Those thorns and thistles make man's work more difficult and more complex because the ground from there on would hesitatingly give its yield. While work was part of man's activity prior to the fall, this time he will have to sweat in the labors in order to provide for himself and his family. So men don't hesitate, don't, don't hesitate, and don't be surprised if you have to roll up your sleeves, dirty your hands, and sweat it out in order to work and get some yield. I said, I don't say I'm going I don't listen, listen, we're living in a fallen world, okay? I know I know all of us would prefer, you know, on all of our labor, as I, you know, many people try to beat the curse. You know, if I only get my, you know, my my millions, so I can retire early. And when I retire early, what am I going to do? I'll just travel here and there, and as if it's going to be, no, it's going to be boring. We, my wife and I, met somebody, you know, every sometime, forgot part of the year, in Pampanga, there are people who fly air balloons in Pampanga in Clark. So we met some of those guys. <clears throat> uh, I solemnized the wedding in uh, Boracay and these guys went to Boracay and they owners there's a wedding. So they, we met them at uh, breakfast <clears throat> and uh, said, can we attend the wedding? Sure. So we had a chance to talk with these guys. I mean, they, they bring their air balloons I mean, these are rich people. And they travel all over the world just to bring those balloons. So you wonder, is that all you do? Yeah, I mean, these people are, wow. I, mean, I cannot even imagine how wealthy they are. But when they talk about their life and we're talking about them and they attended the wedding, we went to Genesis chapter 2. And of course, towards the end of my message, we talked about the fall. And you know what they said to me? You know, Pastor, I was seven, eight years old, I heard those messages. I've never heard it since. So what are you? I said, well, you know, I don't know what I am. He said, let me guess. You are a secularist. You're living your life. I said, this is all the world there is. You're not living in reality. You're living in a distant land. You're living in a make-believe. And many people are living in that kind of a world. A world of make-believe. They have adopted the Walt Disney philosophy. This philosopher, this biggish Pumba philosopher who says, this is the philosophy I live in, Hakuna Matata. A problem-free philosophy. And it's not real. In fact, the film itself shows you that. The prince, the lion, 
was living in an escapist world. A lot of us live in an escapist world. We're not living in reality. We're living in a fallen world. So get ready to get hurt, to sweat it out. This is not heaven. Well, Pastor, if I can only go to America, I only go to the Middle East, go here and there. It's not heaven there. There's no heaven here on earth. Because we're living in a fallen world. That's what the Bible says. So make sure you be where God wants you to be. That's where, that's the safest place to be in. That's not necessarily the, the coolest place to be in. You know. God's people, the Holy New Testament saints, prophets, and apostles were living in the core of God's perfect will. And by the way, let me remind you, they, many of them were martyred to death. See, the folly of the prosperity gospel. If I only get saved, boy, it's going to be a bed of roses. Not in scripture. And when preachers promise you, you get saved and you will get all the money you can get. And that's exactly what people want to hear in this fallen world. And it's not real. So, <clears throat> all of these thorns and thistles make man's work more difficult and complex. Finally, God's judgment affected also his existence on earth. Sickness suffering, physical death became part of man's earthly sojourn. It is now a reality as a result of his disobedience. He will work and he will have to work until he dies. And his body will return where? Where it belongs. According to verse 19, it says, <clears throat> For thou dost, for dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. They say, did you know that that's God's reminder to Adam, to Eve, and to all of us? When the devil gave Eve that intoxicating thought, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, enough of that false dream. When you die, you're going back to dust. That's the reality. So don't be misled by people who promise you heaven and earth. A utopia that does not reflect reality. Oh, if you only drink this medicine, you will have the fountain of youth. You will never die. Oh my. You only use this medicine. The president used this medicine. And this big shot used this medicine. Look at him. Where is he now? He's dead. Like we said in our Sunday school, all that the experts and medical, med medical practitioners can do is to delay death. But they cannot cure you from ultimate death. Have you ever seen a situation where the doctor says, yeah, you have six months to live and the doctor died before the six months? Because we're all subject to death. And the dust thou art, from dust thou art, from dust shalt thou return. So much for the ambitions of divinity. Humankind may think of being like God, but God declares, dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Don't be duped by these new agers or those who false they promise a utopia that is so contradictory to biblical reality. So let me move on. We saw the judgment of God. God's unbending punishment. You say, how severe is that punishment? We like this. God is just. God is holy. But we already saw a glimmer of hope in the Proto-Evangelium. In the midst of pronouncement of death and destruction was the promise of a seed of the woman who will eventually crush the head of the serpent. Firstly, hinted in Genesis 3.15. So let us move on. In God's unmerited, unmerited provision. And in verse 20, and unto Adam. Did you know this? Unless you're certain, if, unless, if you just read this, uh, you know, browse through it, you will miss the whole point. The careful student of Scripture will find some of these gems. The Bible says, unto Adam, 
And Adam called his wife's name Eve. You know why? Her name Eve means because she was the mother of all living. So is there any special significance with that? Well, with life now uncertain and death is now made sure as a consequence of sin, it is interesting that in the biblical narrative, Adam names his wife Eve, the mother of all living. His reason was she was the mother of all living. Again, I quote Alan Ross, who observes this, and I quote him saying, The expositor will have to look at this verse very carefully in order to appreciate its significance in the context. At first, it seems out of place, but a closer analysis of the meaning of and motivation for the name, especially in contrast with the prospect of death as a punishment for sin, will show that it indicates Adam's faith. That whole incident shows that they accepted their lot in a fallen world. But he held on to the promise on the positive side of it. Life would continue. That's why she, he called her Eve. In other words, amid all the pronouncements of the death sentence by calling woman Eve, Adam confessed faith in God and his promise of life and salvation as hinted in the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3.15. Adam said, we're guilty. We deserve the punishment. But thank God, he's giving us a glimmer of hope. There is going to be a seed of the woman promised who will crush the head of the serpent. Notice the promise of salvation. In contrast to the fig leaves, remember in verse 6, when Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves fig leaves. That was their human attempt in order to cover up their guilt and their sin. And that's exactly what man is doing to the present day, to the 21st century. They're doing everything possible, a human covering for their guilt. It could be rituals, it could be relics, it could be rosary beads, it could be religion, regardless of the label. All of these are fake leaves and God will not accept these human coverings. That will not satisfy the outraged justice of God. Your covering, my covering for my guilt will never satisfy God's outraged justice. That is why in verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. What a beautiful portion of scripture. As early as Genesis chapter 3, we see God himself providing the covering that was acceptable to him. Their former covering was inadequate, to say the least. This one was made by God himself. Those coats of skins were animal skins. The implication is that an animal must have been slain. Perhaps its blood was shed as atonement for man's sin. The rest of biblical revelation reaches that salvation is of the Lord. Jonah 2.9 if sinners are ever to be delivered from sin and its consequences, salvation is to come from God himself, not from the religion, man-made coverings, not from our fig leaves. It is, the, it is grounded on the death of an innocent substitute, Hebrews 9.28. God must, God must have killed an innocent animal, placed his outraged justice and holiness on that innocent animal. Kill that animal eventually. And it carried out by it was carried out by the shedding of blood. If this was if this was what happened then, then we have a picture and a precedent of how redemption from sin was going to be executed in Christ. Moses wrote this, his original audience were the Israelites. And those Jews would have seen the connection as early as this point. Oh, so no wonder all the Old Testament sacrifices and the tabernacle, the shedding of blood, points us back to this is what was established in the Garden of Eden after the fall. And so it is in the New Testament. That's why when the New Testament comes, the beginning chapters of the New Testament 
John the Baptist comes and says, Behold, this time here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Nothing else can and nothing else will. Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Very clearly, from Old to the New Testament, man have found have found that their sin reaches beyond their own life and person, that it inflicts injury and involves disturbance and distress, that it changes utterly our relationship to life and to God, and that we can rise above its consequences except by the intervention of God Himself, by an intervention which tells us of the sorrow He suffers on our account. And what is the chief point? In other words, God is the only one who delivers and relieves man from his shame. And he has provided that deliverance in the person and the work of his son, Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Finally, notice the provision of protection. The expulsion in verses 23 and 24. They were expelled from Eden. But the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden was both an act of judgment and is also an act of grace. Our first parents can no longer enjoy the bliss of fellowship with God within the ideal conditions of that garden because of their willful disobedience. It was also intended to prevent them from being confirmed permanently in wickedness because it says, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. They have partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But what if they eat of the tree of the life, of life? They would have been confirmed in wickedness, no room for salvation. So it was an act of judgment to expel them from the Garden of Eden, but it was also an act of grace, lest they become confirmed in their sin. God wanted, provide, wanted and provided Redemption, restoration, forgiveness to sinful man. He didn't provide that for the angels, but he provided that for Adam and even for the rest of Adam's posterity. This indicates that partaking of the tree of life in their sinful state would have removed all possibility for sinful man to enjoy eternal life. If this is the case, then man would be better way off, better off away from that tree. The placing of the cherubims east of the garden made access to the tree of life humanly impossible and rightfully so for salvation since then can only be received through the supernatural work of God accomplished by the finished substitutionary work of Christ and executed by the convicting and quickening work of the Holy Spirit here's the clear lesson sinful rebellion against God brings pain conflict, death, but confession to God ensures God's gracious provisions. Israel and all men need to learn that all dealings of God with sinners can be traced back to the first disobedience. Their God was a saving God, however, to which the provision of clothes for Adam and Eve attested. In Israel's sacrifices, were made according according to the prescribed manner of the law. The animals' lives were taken in exchange for the human seeking atonement, and the skins were given to the priests for their use. The sinful worshiper thus lived because of God's provision and instruction. It was so then at the Garden of Eden, it was so in the Old Testament, it is so in the New Testament, it is so today. The only way you and I can be cleansed and be forgiven of our sin is not through your religion or your relics or your rosary beads. It's not even through your own righteousnesses. It's through God's redemptive work in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know him as your Savior? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have you trusted in him? You say, Pastor, I am a Christian. I have trusted in Christ. But is there sin in your life that needs to be resolved? Listen, the only place for restoration, reconciliation, 
forgiveness and cleansing is found at the cross of Calvary. It can be found nowhere else. Are you tired? Are you bitter? Are you angry? Because of a fallen world? Are you blaming everybody else? Accept your faith. We are in a fallen world. And while the rest of the world may choose to go to hell, I hope you will say, I want to get right with God and live for Him. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you. Thank you for these narratives, these inspired narratives that all point us to Jesus Christ. Oh, how great our salvation is provided for through your Son. Thank you for reminding us of how it all began and where it all began. Thank you for giving us a more biblical perspective so that we have a proper view of the world in which we live. So that we do not fall into false hopes or false expectations. In a fallen world in which we live, well, all that we deserve is death, decay, and condemnation. But yet, thank you for providing room for reconciliation to the substitutionary sacrifice of your son. If there is anyone who has not trusted in Christ, bring him under conviction. That he may flee from the wrath to come, taking refuge in Christ. For those of us who already the so, perhaps there are issues we need to resolve with you. May our souls find rest by simply confessing our sins to you and claiming our forgiveness through the shed blood of your son. Hence, my eyes closed, no one look around.